the most cited work in qualitative analysis definitely is the discovery of Grauner theory. Discovery of Grauner theory was written by Glaser and Strauss in 1967, and it has become really, really popular throughout the qualitative analysis landscape. Why is that? Why is Grauner theory so immensely popular? Well, probably because it's often miscited, but that's a bit of a false argument. Why it's so popular is because of its influential key concepts. Several key concepts in Grauner theory, several key elements in Grauner theory, were really revolutionary, new, and triggered the sociological imagination of many researchers. Second reason why it's so popular is because it, it, it was one of the first books in which the complete book was about a certain a specific methodology and it was highly detailed, so it would help you in giving rules how to go about in your research and to help you in taking small steps in your interpretation and then still ground it to the data. And lastly, the last 20 years it has become really popular due to software. Software developers found out that grounded theory was ideal to translate into software tools. Key concepts from Grauner theory, key rules in Grauner theory, were pretty easily transposed to software. And therefore, new qualitative researchers that, that touched upon uh, qualitative analysis started with, these, with this software and then ended up with doing or reading about Grauner theory. So therefore, Grauner theory is extremely popular nowadays. It was revolutionary in 1967. It was very new, it was innovative. Why? Why was this so revolutionary? Well, in the 1960s, there was another view of science pretty dominant, especially in American sociology. It was more about deduction, about grand theories that were applied. Discussions were going on about how to do research top-down or bottom-up, and there were discussions going on about, about theoretical imagination uh, versus uh, rigorous methodologies, but Grounder theory was revolutionary because it didn't say we are going to do theory or we are going to do data analysis. No, what they said was we are going to link data analysis with theory, and Grounder theory was inductive as opposed to much of the deductive work, but it wasn't naive inductivism. Grounder theory was also revolutionary because what they said was data analysis takes place during data collection. And obviously, ethnographers did that for ages. But in sociology, this was pretty new. And many people would first get the data and then start analyzing or start writing. It was also revolutionary because they were very much against the hypothetical deductive view of science that was pretty popular at that time. And they said, well, what these hypothesis checkers are doing is they're not testing their hypothesis, but they're just checking their theory. So they're not falsifying, they're verifying their theory. And if they can't verify their theory, they say the hypothesis is wrong, um, but the theory is still okay. And what they do is they create new hypotheses that become really small and less linked to the live world of people and the study. So, so it, it, it becomes less relevant, they said. And they were also revolutionary because they said, we need qualitative analysis, not for description. We need qualitative analysis because of the deficit of this hypothetical deductive view. We need qualitative analysis in order to create theories. We need to build theories. So, pretty revolutionary. And what are the key elements then in this grounded theory? What are these influential key concepts? Well. The most important concept in Grounder theory is constant comparison. It was so important that at first they even planned to call the book the constant comparative method because 
This is central. It's not about coding. It's not about the revolutionary bit. This is revolutionary. The constant comparison. What is this constant comparison? Well, I will show you. For instance, you interviewed this first hippie. You remember it's 1967, the summer of love. You interview him about his views on the world, about love and peace. And then you go about and interview the second person. And what you do is you compare them. You compare what this person says to what this person says. And then you compare it to this person. And when you do comparison, you can compare interview one with interview two. And in order to do so, you have to reach a higher level. Why? Because always when you compare, especially when you compare three, four, five different interviews, you have to reach a higher level in order to do this comparison. You need a more abstract level. So you reach concepts. So when comparing this interview with this interview, with this interview, with this interview, at a certain point of time, you start to talk about similarities and differences. And these are on a more abstract level. So at first, you're comparing data with data. And then later on, you're star you start comparing these concepts with new data. And then new data again, and new data again, and new data again, and again. So what you do is compare data with data, data with concepts, concepts with data, and then you start to compare concepts with concepts. So these are little steps you take. Constantly, you're comparing data, 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 concepts, concepts, concepts. And that's revolutionary. Second key element of ground theory is its strong focus on the research process as a process. How? Well, first, they use the concept of Bloomer about sensitizing concepts. Every concept is temporary. And they're provisional, they, they give some guidance, but that's it. You shouldn't pin them down. They're not written in stone. Concepts are temporary and you develop them throughout your research. So it's a processual approach. The second bit is that you're testing for deviant cases. Like in analytic induction, you are on the lookout for deviant cases. In your constant comparison, you try to find these deviant cases because they help you. Similarities help you, definitely. But contradictions help you probably much more. A third aspect of this focus on, on process is the writing of memos. Way more important than coding is the writing of memos in grammar theory. In order to build your theory, create your transparency, your famous audit trail, and reflect. The third key element of Grounder theory, and the third revolutionary aspect of Grounder theory, is that sampling in Grounder theory is completely different from sampling in survey research. In survey research, you take a small sample with which you try to say something about the population. In qualitative analysis, that's often ridiculous. What you want to do is to take a small sample and say something about theory. So what you try to do is not representation, but saturation. You try to have theoretical saturation. And theoretical saturation you reach when your theory is so sophisticated that every new data point, every new interview does not lead to more refinement of your concepts or your categories that you've created. The fourth key element of Grounder theory is, as I said before, the creation of a theory. Rather than just describing, Glaser and Strauss said, we need theories. Theories that are connected, grounded in the data. So what steps do we need to take then when doing Grounder theory? Well, as Glazer later said, all is data. So when you gather your material, you can gather everything. You can, gather, you can use interviews, you can use observation, you can use advertisements, you can use anything that is relevant for you. So all is data. And then when you do this constant comparison, you compare data with data and concepts will arise. And not just a single concept, but many concepts. 
And from these concepts, new categories uh, arise. And these categories, they do not arise automatically. No, they arise because you compare a concept with a concept. And you say, well, maybe they fit in. Maybe there's a, this is a subform of this category. So you try to organize all these different concepts into categories. Many people would call these codes. And then you try to link those categories to certain properties, probably some conditions or consequences or any other properties of these categories. And you try to link these categories to each other by relations or theses or theorems or whatever you want to call them. But you try to relate these categories. And in the end, you try to create a core category, a single category that is the most important aspect of your complete theory. And you try to build a storyline around this core category. So this looks pretty simple, but is it? Well, obviously it's not. In later forms of grounded theory, many discussions how to go about and how to do this and how to take these steps have been uh, held. Now, this core category is very important in thinking about different levels of theories, different types of theories. As you can see here, there are two dimensions of grounded theories. First, there's the dimension of substantive versus a formal theory, and there's the dimension of micro theory up to macro theory. Usually, grounded theories start around here more micro-level based and substantive. But the goal of a grounded theory in the long run is to get to more formal level theories. What does it mean? Well, it means that here you describe a bit more. You get to a theoretical level, but your theory is applicable to a certain substantive field. Whereas if you develop your theory more and more and more, probably, or that's at least what you strive for, your theory will be applicable to more different substantive fields and then become more formal. And it might become more macro, but it doesn't need to be. So there are different grounded theories. And in another lecture, I will show that there are different forms of grounded theory based on different authors.